Hello, welcome to another episode of the Talking Rangers podcast. This is episode 20. Today is Wednesday, February 14th, 2024. I'm Bubs alongside Joe, and joining us today are the first guest is the first guest in channel history, NHL and Rangers on crew, Johnny Lazarus. Johnny, thanks so much for coming on. How's it going, man? First guest in the history. Holy hell, you guys picked me. I'm honored. I didn't know that. Um, thank you guys for having me, Bubs, Joe. Good to talk with you guys, and uh, I'm excited for this for this conversation. Rangers are buzzing, and uh, it's been a fun week. Yes, yeah, definitely a good time to be a Ranger fan after a rough D, uh, January. They've turned it around here after the All Star break. So I kind of just wanted to start with this, get your overall impressions, your overall thoughts on the season, and of course, you're around the team a lot, covering them. What is your overall thoughts on the vibe around the locker room, and then just the performance, of course, on the ice? Well, the season's been a roller coaster ride, that's for sure. Because, you know, even before the season started, everyone's expectations were, you know, most likely third place in the Metro. You know, the team wasn't uh, built with speed, I would say. Everyone looked at the age of all the forwards and, you know, where this team was kind of headed. And I think there were a lot more concerns and there were uh, positive things about the way the roster was built. But again, you know, you bring in a new coaching staff, you never really know what can happen. And in Peter Laviolette's, you know, recent history in his first year with a new team, He's done pretty well, and uh, that's been the case with a lot of coaches in the NHL. And, you know, it's kind of paid off right away. And then, you know, they had that two-month stretch where there's there's a lot of concern, and, and there's reasons to be concerned because, you know, when you go through a 7-10 to game skid, it's, it's like, okay, you know, it's that time of the year where guys kind of, you know, lose focus for a bit. It's the holidays, All-Stars coming up. But then when it turns into 20-25 games, it's like, oh, boy, what, what do we got here? Is this our identity? You know, what do we – what do we think of our group? Um, and I think they figure that out now, you know, post all-star break and, you know, obviously the confidence definitely disappeared for a bit, but something Peter Laviolette has preached all year long is that within a season there's peaks and valleys and you just hope to have more peaks than valleys. Um, and, you know, right now it seems like they are in one of those peaks and obviously there's a big game tomorrow night an even bigger game on Sunday. And hopefully this group can kind of build off of what they've done now in the last five games and, go on another run here kind of yeah, like build, kind of building off of uh what you're saying about like lavalette one of the things i wanted to ask was um like what do you see as like the differences between the coaching style and at practice as someone who saw what gallant was with his team compared to what lavalette is like what do you think is like the biggest difference in like both aspects practice and then just the coaching style and like in general um, to be fully transparent, I wasn't really around Gerard Gallant practices. Uh, I didn't start covering the team till like, you know, one game left of the season last year. So, uh, I didn't make it out to many practices, but being with this team this year, since day one of training camp, um, you can just sense the intensity and, you know, talking to guys around the rink, like early on, um, you know, they were intimidated by Peter Laviolette and even, even the older guys, some of them. Um, and, and that's something that's, you know, I don't want to say so uncommon because, you know, I've talked to Islander players after Patrick Waugh came in and, you know, even guys like Matt Martin who have been in the league for over a decade, like, you know, it's a coaching change. It's, it's scary. It's uh, well, not scary. It's, it's more exciting than it is scary, but it's guys that are, you know, playing for, for new roles, new jobs, new, um, I, I guess, perspectives from the coaching staff where, you know, a guy like Alexi Lafreniere, let's say, for example, you know, under the previous coaches has been looked at as a third line guy, maybe um, didn't show as much skill as he, does have in his um, repertoire and, you know, under a new coach gets a new opportunity and a new chance and thrives under it. And now you see him kind of taking off, but then there's, you know, the other guys like Capo Caco who, you know, came into training camp looking insanely confident and never really found it in the regular season. And right now he's still trying to find it. Um, but, you know, credit to him because he's found a role on this team on that third line. Now with Johnny Rudzinski and Will Cooley and the three of them have been pretty good together. The last three games, they have a goal in all three. Um, and they're looking like they could be a solid third line. But, you know, back to the original question, just the coaching style seems to be, you know, more of a buy-in. Um, you know, Laviolette comes out and, and and doesn't call out individual players. He's very protective of his players, but he'll call out the team. And even in a win, um, you know, he doesn't really sugarcoat anything and, um, you know, expects 110% effort from his guys every night and uh, is pretty honest when they don't bring it. So um, I think just keeping guys accountable and, uh, you know, having an honest assessment of the team and not just – you know, coming out and saying, I liked our effort, you know, that, that happened a lot last year or the last two years under Gallant where the Rangers would lose like four to two or five to two and Gallant would come out and say, I like their effort. You know, like that's just, 
it's just not really how winning is done, I'd say, from a coaching staff. Um, but yeah, it's just been a, a level of intensity that, that Bobby, Bobby Lett brings. Yeah, it's definitely been a breath of fresh air from a fan's perspective. And on the topic of Lavalette, you know, we've seen, you know, you mentioned Lafreniere is playing with a lot more confidence this season, having a very good season. Um, and in Kapokaku, of course, dealt with the injuries, still having some of those bumps in the road. Um, but a guy that I think has benefited a lot is Artemi Panarin by Lavalette. Do you feel, you know, he's had a huge season um, on pace to potentially break the all-time point record in Ranger history. Um, do you feel... Panarin, that was more him getting that shot first mentality in the offseason, or do you feel that was more the coaching staff Lavalette implementing that shot first mentality where we saw him pass up a lot of good looks last year that he's not passing up this season? Well, I think it's a mix of both. Um, you know, Artemi Panarin last year after the playoffs, he was very down himself. And uh, you know, he came out pretty openly about it and said that, you know, no matter how hard he tried and tried and tried, he kept, you know, disappointing himself. Um, you know, obviously that, that first round series was disappointing for most players. And, uh, you know, I think he took it upon himself to want to come back and just, you know, prove some of the fans wrong. Fans were down on him. And, and trust me, if there's one thing I've learned in this job, for the most part, players know what fans are saying, what fans are thinking. Like they see a lot of things, uh, you know, that you might think they don't. Um, so Panarin, I think just came in with somewhat of a chip on his shoulder and, you know, for the first time. Probably since he's been here, uh, he had that chip on his shoulder, right? Because, like, you think back to 21, 22, they're still kind of in that rebuild. No one expects them to really go very far. They make the Eastern Conference final, then all these expectations build up for last year, and they fail. They there, There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Last year was a failure of a season with the roster that they had and the expectations that were built for them. So this year, you have something to prove. And, uh, you know, that's the case for almost everyone that was on that team last year. So I think a lot of that is on him. But something that Lobby Lett's done since the beginning of the season is reward Panarin with extra ice time when he's playing well defensively, when he's creating. I mean, I've seen Artemi Panarin double shifted more this season than he has been, I think, in his previous years as a Ranger combined. Um, so you got to reward the coaching staff on that end. But I think a lot of it does come within from Artemi Panarin. Do you think it's kind of like a, I wouldn't say make or break, but this probably is going to be one of the biggest postseasons for Panarin because he kind of, I'm not saying he was terrible in 2022, but they had the long run. He had the overtime goal, but I don't think personally he probably thought he was great. And then last year, obviously the whole team as a whole was, you said like was a failure. He didn't get past the devils, but I think he had points on the first two goals of the series. And like that yeah, was I it. Think, I think that yeah. was it. Yeah. Do so you think it's kind of like a make or break for him this postseason? I mean, listen, I think the Rangers right now are one of those teams, and it's something I talked about on my show what, last week. Like, th there's certain organizations right now where it doesn't matter what you do in the regular season, it just matters how you perform in the playoffs. But there's other teams that the regular season definitely does matter. And like, some of those teams I think about are, you know, in the first category, teams where, you know, the Oilers go on a 16 game winning streak. Whoop de doo. Who cares? They don't win in the playoffs. None of that shit matters. Rangers, their regular season, they can get first place in the Metro. They don't make it to the Eastern Conference final, probably a failure of a season. Whereas you look at the Vancouver Canucks, a team that's been in the basement for the last like four or five years, they're having a great regular season. That matters because they needed that. They needed something of a, you know, just a, an overall 180 of their culture. Um, you know, last year, obviously, they were a mess with Bruce Brujo behind the, behind the bench. They bring in Rick Tockett. He turns them around. You know, they're having a, a great year. And if they don't win a playoff round, not the biggest deal because this season is a success with what they did in the first 82 games. So like there's different, you know, narratives around that, I think. And with Panarin, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, in New York, it's always a, what have you done for me lately? I mean, like, yep. and Panarin, he, if he doesn't perform in the playoffs, he might have that, like that Julius Randall kind of, I don't know if it's like a curse, but yeah. that, that like whole kind of vibe around him. Right. And Randall, you know, he's got to be the most love hate athlete in New York right now, I imagine. I mean, he had that incredible, what, 2021 playoff maybe against the Hawks or, or no, he was, he was he good, good that Hawks season. Or, yeah, he was, he was great that, that season and then that sucked season. in the playoffs, right? Yeah. 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 So, you know, that's kind of what happened with Panarin last year. And with the exceptional season he's had this year, if he doesn't live up to that, then it's just, oh, this is a regular season killer. He doesn't have it in the playoffs. Like, that's just, yeah. that's what it becomes. And there's kind of no way around it until you finally do it. And and that's just, you know, how sports work. 
And, you know, I would hate for that to happen because personally, I love our time Panera and he's probably one of my favorite athletes to talk to. Um, the guy is like just incredibly happy all the time. Incredibly nice. Like always says hello to everybody. Like I, you know, I, I wish every Ranger fan had a chance to meet him because he definitely does a great job at just making people smile. Um, but again, like in New York, it, it is a put up or shut up kind of city. Right. So he's got to get it done. You think any of it's the haircut? Um, I don't know, man. Like that was, that was weird seeing him originally. Yeah. Uh, his hair has grown back a little bit. Maybe he will buzz it again for the playoffs. Who knows? Um, they, they, they do say the less hair you have, the more hour dynamic you are. Maybe that is a thing. I don't know. You know, I think what swimmers like shave their legs and their arms and stuff to be faster and, and stuff. Yep. So, you know, maybe we can make a case there, but I don't know if it's really the haircut. Yeah, definitely was, uh, definitely was an unexpected sight, but it's working. So we'll take it. Yeah. I thought it was Photoshop when I first saw it. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> Same. I thought it, I, I couldn't believe that was real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, another thing I kind of want to talk about, you kind of mentioned Kako earlier, like, what are your thoughts on how he's been in general and then how he's been since coming back from that injury? Man, um, this is a deep one because preseason, I was like, this is it. This is Kako's year. Like, he looks so good. His confidence was through yeah. the roof. He looked strong. He looked quick. Uh, you know, I think his first preseason game, he scored in like the first 15 seconds against the Islanders, like right off the bat. And I was like, oh, he's taken off. And Lafreniere was the opposite. Like Lafreniere's preseason was pretty bad. Like, you know, people were saying he looked out of shape. Like, you know, it, it was just crazy how opposite things have turned out this year. Yeah. Um, but with Kako, you know, it's funny. I was like kind of going at it in our blue crew chat today um, <laughs> over text. Like literally at seven in the morning, I woke up to like 10 texts from the guys about like Capo Kako. And I was like, are we, are we like, we're doing this right now? <laughs> um, and Kako's fine. He's buddy, he, but he, but that's it. He, he's like fine. And you want to give him a break because of the difficult year he's had, but we're talking about a guy who's been in the league now for four or five years. You know, it's, I know he's only 23, but like at some point, the promise has to show. Uh, it's fine that he's a third liner. I, I think there's room for that and there's a need for that, but there's still this level of attachment from Ranger fans. I think that I think this guy could be an 80, 90 point guy. And, and you know, I'm not going to say he can't be one day, but there's been no signs of that. I think, you know, at least during his time as a Ranger and I'm not saying he's not impactful, not impactful or invaluable, but I just don't think it's fair to look at him and say, this is a number two overall pick anymore. Like, I, I don't, I don't think there should be an attachment to that because at some point players are who they are and who they become. And in this organization, you know, I hate to say it, but he's just not a top six guy. He, he he's had the opportunity and hasn't ran with it. And at what point do you kind of just look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is the role I have in this team. And now I just have to master this role. Jimmy Vesey's done it. You know, Jimmy Vesey's become a great fourth line player and he's a guy who won the Hobie Baker. He's a guy who was a highly touted prospect and he had to adjust his game when he realized he couldn't be that top six guy in the NHL. So I think we're at the point now where Kako kind of has to do that unless, you know, he is traded and gets a new opportunity somewhere else and a fresh start, which we've seen work for a lot of players. But, you know, I think there's this whole Tage Thompson effect, right? Where Tage had, you know, maybe a rough like first four or five years in the NHL, then gets traded to Buffalo and his first couple of years aren't great either. But then out of nowhere, well, not out of nowhere, because he had all the, you know, intangibles, I guess, he explodes. And I think people are still holding on to that with Kako, and that just might not be the case. So um, I think he's just got to learn to embrace this third line role, which it seems like he has and try to you know be a positive impact every night that he can be i just don't think he's going to be a guy that scores 25 30 goals in a year he hasn't really shown the ability to finish or the or the hunger you know yeah definitely you mentioned uh possibly getting traded or being dealt similar to tage thompson you think there is any chance he gets dealt this deadline or do you think that's something that is potentially more future um i mean he is an unrestricted no no he's a restricted free agent at the end of the year um so I don't imagine it's tough. Uh, I, I obviously understand the conversations being had around him because, you know, the value on him is, is probably not so high right now. And I don't know if it can get higher. 
but you'd have to think to get rid of Kako, you need someone with term. And the one player that I've kind of been, okay, this is a guy that could come in and, and really help this team right now is like a Boone Jenner, who I think has two years left on his deal. Um, you know, he could step in and be that strong third line center, and maybe bump Brodzinski over to the right wing or even Brodzinski down to the fourth line. And I love Johnny Brodzinski. I want to see him in this lineup every night. I think he's been great. Um, but I think the only way you get rid of Kako is you don't do it for a rental because right now he's a, he's a cheaper player that plays third line minutes and it's not a big cap hit. Um, so I think there is a fit for him for sure, but to get rid of him for, you know, something that's not guaranteed for the next two, three years, I would say is just not a good move because let's face it. Like the Rangers aren't built for the future. They're built to win in the next, you know, two, three years max. I'd say like, that's why you bring in LaViolette. Um, that's when you have Shisirk and sign until I think another two years, maybe 25, 26 is when his contract's up. Um, and then like, you know, all, all the core basically, um, is yeah. built for now. So, if you're trading Kako, it's got to be someone who comes in for the next two, three years that can help this team win right away. Not for a yeah, draft. Agree. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, Another guy that has had a little bit of an up and down season, you know, he's known for having his select months. Mika Sabanajad's had a, a, a rocky season, I think, to say the least. You know, especially recently he had Mika December and then similar to the team struggled in January and hasn't really completely put his, put his foot back on the gas again. Are you at all concerned about Mika or, you know, at throughout his career at times, he's gone through these sh streakiness as a player where he'll go an entire month of playing out of this world. Great. And then he'll be non-existent on, um, on the ice. Like he is like, he's been recently. Are you at all concerned? Do you think he's going to break out of this? What have been your thoughts on him overall this season, which has been a little bit bumpy? I, I wouldn't say he's non-existent because he's, he's still playing yeah. well defensively. Um, I, I think for him, it's just that, that hunger um like in the game the other night he had two separate two-on-ones with chris Kreider and passed up both and yeah. and he had the shooting lane on both of them uh i think one of them was in the second period he came down on his off wing and like picked his leg up to fake the shot and passed to Kreider and Kreider whiffed on it but like he had that you know i thought he was going top glove and like you know the meek i've seen in the past he's ripping that thing every every time um i don't know what it is that makes him think he Shouldn't shoot the puck, uh, but for whatever reason, he's just been way more passive this year than in years prior. And I, I still think, you know, he's what? He's got 48 points, I think, something like that in, in the 52, 53. Yeah, he's game. almost a point a game. He's yeah, cool. almost. More, like, he's still producing. And, and I think people are, I don't want to say they're too hard on him because he is your number one center. Like, you need your number one center to score at five on five. Like, you need that. There, there's no excuses. I think he had. Last time I looked, it was like five five on five goals in the last like thirty games, which uh, you know isn't great, obviously. But yep. you know the, the big thing for him right now is that the power play is struggling, um, and the Rangers feed off their power play, and I think they're like oh for their last sixteen attempts over the last like seven games, um, and they're winning hockey games, which is wild because if you told me the Rangers hadn't scored a power play goal in seven games, I would think they're in the gutter, just with how this team is done, and, and like. You know, one of my not favorite, not like I'm not happy to bring it up, but one of my favorite things to bring up with last year's first round playoff series was the Rangers scored power play goals in three games in that series. They won all three. They didn't score power play goals in four games. They lost all four of the Devils. It's kind of like, you know, I know you guys are New York sports guys. It's it's like the Knicks living and dying by the three. When your shot's not hitting, team's not yeah. winning. And that's the same way with the Rangers power play. Although this stretch right now, I don't know what the hell is going on. And they're just getting, yeah. you know, great goaltending from quick and just but, you know, back to, to Mika, like once the power play gets going again, I think maybe that'll translate five on five. But um, with him, it's just that shoot first mentality that you've seen Panarin have that, that flip just, or that switch just has to flip for Mika. Like you got to see him hungry a little bit. Would you say that the struggle on the power play maybe could be, like kind of contributing to Zabanja not playing well, or at least offensively, like not shooting. Cause like normally when the power play is buzzing, you have his one timer, like it's going in like almost at like a 50% rate. And you kind of like, he's completely gone away from that. Like if you notice him on the power play, he's not shooting. And a lot of times he's looking for that, like set play back door where like Kreider mm -hmm. like tips it to him. But like, why? Like I just, it's kind of confusing to me why he's not 
like lining up in that circle and using his one time shot. Yeah. I mean, I think earlier in the year, the, the shots just weren't going in, right? They just weren't falling. Yeah. Um, what do you have? Like two goals in the first like 16 games, something like that. It um, took a while. Yeah. Cause yeah, I think he got the first two goals in that one game against maybe it was like the Oilers. Like, I think he scored um, two goals in that one game and like, that was it. Yeah. I, I honestly, this year has been so long. I can't yeah. even like, remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, I know he struggled out of the gate and like, you know, obviously it's never good to just have a slow start to the year, but um, you know, it is Mika March in two weeks. So that always, that seems to, to be the month where he gets going. So um, that's a good thing. But yeah, I think, you know, with, with anything, when you're not scoring on the power play, it certainly affects your confidence, especially when, you know, you are considered to be a power play threat. Like a year ago, we were talking about, you know, outside of Alexander Ovechkin, who's the biggest one-time threat on the power play in the NHL. And like, you know, I'm putting Mika up there. I'd say Mika, Pasta, and Tage Thompson are the, are the next three. Stammer. Um, Stammer too. Yep. Stammer too. Good call. Um, and then like on the, on the other side, you got like a Kucherov, um, who's another lefty. That's a threat in the one-timer. Uh, not really a one-timer. I feel like though he, cause he comes down on his strong side. Kind of like, like skates it in. Yeah. He comes down on the strong flank. Um, but he, yeah, he has scored one time goals. Obviously Matthews is, he's going to be the best goal scorer of all time. Like go will break the record and then Matthews will break his record. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, you gotta see pucks go in to get confident. That's really all it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that hopefully they can break out of here. And yeah, you got Mika March. He's also got two games against the Flyers here within the next month. So mm -hmm. maybe that's that's an opportunity for him here to feast as well. Um, Man, I took Mika first goal scorer that game in Philly, like that afternoon game, I think on a Saturday. Right. It took him like 45 yeah, seconds to get it. I was like, this is the yeah. best bet ever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's he's always a lock in, in those ones. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned a little bit of Igor and Quick. It's, I think, you know, the perfect way to describe it, Igor hasn't been himself a lot this year, you know, going into the all-star break save percentage was below 900, which is certainly concerning, not the Vezina Igor we saw two years ago, or even what we saw last year. But I also think there's a lot of credit, not so much Igor playing that bad. I think it's also just quick playing that good and a ton of credit, of course, goes to Ben Willaire, who continues to work magic with these goalies. What have been your impressions on both those guys? And do you feel the win against the Flames, the shutout for Igor, his first since April of last year is the start of something? For him, positive momentum moving forward. I mean, yeah, it's definitely you know big for him moving forward for sure because there was a lot of concern, um, you know, leading into that game. And I still think, you know, one good game doesn't solve everything, but it's certainly a step in the yeah. right direction. And with Jonathan Quick, you know, right now, if I had to pick a uh, Stephen McDonald extra effort award winner, he's my pick. No matter how well Panarin's played, uh, Trocheck's had a great year. Lafreniere's had a great year. Jacob Trubas had a great year. Without Jonathan Quick, I don't know what this team looks like. Um, you know, last year, I think Yaroslav Halak was like 0-8-1 in his first nine starts um, with the Rangers. Like, you need your backup to do well or at least play 500 hockey, and Jonathan Quick has gone above and beyond um, yeah. in goal. So, you know, luckily for the Rangers, it's a good problem to have. They have two guys they can rely on, and I do think they're going to start Quick tomorrow against Montreal to give Igor the outdoor game on Sunday. But again, like... I'm not quite sure with Laviolette. Um, you know, he, he doesn't really give too much on the goaltenders prior to the game. He always says he has a plan going into it. So I imagine that would be the plan. But, you know, we saw a quick start against Tampa after beating Colorado. So maybe he starts Igor against Montreal. And then if Igor doesn't play well, quick gets the net on Sunday. So I don't really know what's going to happen here. But um, <clears throat> either way, it's it's two goalies. It's a 1A, 1B. Um, and, and honestly, like, either one could be either. Like it could be Igor is the one A and Quick is the one B or Quick is the one A, Igor is the one B. It doesn't matter. They're they're two goalies that can win you a hockey game. And I think the biggest thing with Quick this year was that Jonathan Quick was stealing games, whereas Igor was not. Um, and that's something that we were used to seeing Igor Shesterkin do. Like the Rangers would get peppered, they get outshot like 40 to 25. Igor would stop 38 pucks, the Rangers would win the game. That wasn't happening this year. Um, and, and that's obviously you know, it's a little hard to judge because I, I think when you're used to seeing someone go above and beyond and they kind of come back down to earth, it's not like they're playing so poorly, but they're just not playing exceptional. Um, and, you know, to, to Igor's credit, the team wasn't really great in front of him. Like, you look at that Chicago game last week, you know, to the, the, the first goal maybe he could have had, good shot from the point. Second and third goal, the Rangers do a terrible job of boxing out in front of the net. Nick Foligno gets a backdoor tap in. Gustafson is just kind of standing there. 
And then Dickinson deflects a puck and he's untouched. Keandre Miller didn't have his guy. Like he's just kind of standing there in, in open space. Um, so, you know, there's so many different things that go into scoring goals, allowing goals and whatnot. You know, I've heard a lot of coaches say the team in front of you makes three mistakes, which lead to a goal. That's usually how it happens. Um, but, you know, either way, just back to your original question. I know I've kind of been rambling on with all these questions, but uh, yeah, you got two goalies that you can rely on and it's a good problem to have. Yeah, definitely agree. No doubt. So a lot of teams, obviously, you're talking like a goaltender is like one of the things you need. And we have two. Um, there's going to be teams obviously looking for stuff at the deadline. Like, I kind of just want to ask your thoughts. I know you mentioned Boone Jenner. Like, who are there some guys that the Rangers could look at to add during the deadline? I mean, um, what I see today, I saw someone put like a uh, <clears throat> Jordan Eberle and Yanni Gord for like Jones, a pick and Kako, maybe. Um, I don't know if they would do that, but not the Rangers. I don't know if Seattle would do that. I think teams are going to want decent returns from the Rangers. Um, and I think just what this team needs is, you know, I've been preaching this guy for probably two, three months now. If I'm the Rangers, I'm adding two more guys like Will Cooley, two more guys that get to the net, that compete, that can fight that are tough that you just know what you're going to get every night um you know is the goal scoring somewhat of an issue it has been a little bit lately but i, I i'm convinced that with how good this power play is that it'll figure itself out but when you play in the playoffs i think you need more running gun you need to be a harder team to play against and that's why the florida panthers are doing so well and that's why they went on that run last year because they have that perfect mix of skill and that and that grit that hunger like you see guys like matthew kachuk sam bennett Sam Reinhardt around the net, digging for pucks, creating second opportunities, third opportunities, banging bodies, being hard to play against. And that's what this team kind of lacks, you know, outside of like Trocek, Cooley, Lindgren and Truba, like you don't really see a ton of physicality. Um, you know, I'll credit guys like, like VZ and Gaudreau who, who block shots and do all that stuff, but it's not a very in your face game. Um, and I think that's kind of what you need to go on a run. So if the Rangers can bring in, you know, like a Boone Jenner or even like a Yanni Gord, um, you know, players with with that 200 foot compete level and to play, I think that's what will get them to, to get far here. I mean, we saw it last year. They brought in, you know, two skill guys and then the room just it, it, there's just too much skill to pass around and it's tough to figure it out. But you, you just need to be harder to play against. That's really it. And, that, and those are the two names that I would say, you know, you can, I know Frankie Vitrano has been involved in that, too, like. I don't know if Blake Wheeler is the guy you want as your first line right winger to go on a run. So if they could find a way to maybe get a guy like Vetrano, that would help too. But I mean, it's tough to ask to bring in three, four guys at the deadline, right? So uh, yeah. we'll see what happens. But yeah, th th that's the kind of player I think this team needs. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with your take too. Will Cool has been excellent this season, and guys like that certainly help, especially come postseason time. Um, so to kind of close things out here, one more question, just. An overall, I guess, projection here on the postseason, a um, couple different parts. Number one, who do you feel is the biggest threat to this team it come postseason time? Um, and then who do you feel is like the most ideal first round matchup for the Rangers? So, the you know, obviously the opposite of the first one. And then do you feel Stanley Cup is legitimately realistic and achievable this season? You know, it's weird. <laughs> Last year. I thought this team was so much better. I mean, obviously on paper it was, yeah. but the East was such a dogfight last year. And this year yeah. it just seems way more wide open. Um, so I think the Stanley Cup is certainly within possibility this year. And if you asked me prior to the season, I, I don't think I would have said so. I think I, I think I predicted the Rangers to like, you know, I think I said their ceiling was a second round. Like they, they, sh they should win a round, but I don't know if they would make it out of the second round. Now I think. You know, if you got a goalie playing well, if the power play figures itself out, and with the way Lavi let coaches, I, I totally see them being able to do it. Uh, a team that does stand in the way, no one in the Metro concerns me. So I, I'm not going to say the Devils, where the Devils scared the crap out of me <laughs> last year. Um, you know, I'm not going to say the Flyers, Hurricanes, they need to solve their goaltending issues. Although I did say like a week ago or two, or two weeks ago, uh, I thought the Hurricanes were going to run away with the Metro. Um, and I still think they could. They were playing really good hockey going into the break. Um, but as far as the Atlantic goes, Toronto doesn't scare me. 
Boston doesn't really scare me. It, it's really just Florida, I think, um, which seems to be the most complete team right now. But that's really, yeah, that's really it. Like the it's East is, the, it's, it's, it's weird the this year. that no one has besides the Rangers, like goaltending. So yeah, I think I agree. Like, that's such a big thing that yeah. you mentioned, like hurricanes had goaltending problems. Obviously the flyers lost Carter Hart. Um, and then the devils, if they end up making the playoffs, who is their goalie? So it's yeah. like crazy how like spoiled the Rangers are with this goaltending. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think outside of, <laughs> outside of quick and you are the best goalie in the Met this year might be Jari. His record yeah. is pretty yeah. shitty. I think he's like, 14 i think he had like 14 he's got 15 a bunch of shutouts one. though yeah he's been good but his record is terrible he, yeah. he has a losing record but his numbers are good yeah it's certainly i remember last year when we talked heading into the postseason you know we were talking about even if you get past the devils the gauntlet that it took to get to um yeah. the stanley cup final and i totally agree with you this year it's a lot more wide open and just the way the rangers are playing third in the league with points obviously 71 one of the better teams in hockey all year you trust them against anybody uh um, it showed in the final last year too right bubs like florida yeah. was beaten up in that yeah. in that cup final last year like it, it yeah. showed you know it it's such a grind i mean it's it's crazy when you get past the second round you're only halfway through it feels like you've gone through an entire you feel like this the the playoffs should be over and you're only getting to the conference finals you still got eight more wins to go so it's a gauntlet and um Hopefully they can hopefully they can achieve it and take it home this year because New York sports can definitely definitely use a title. I'll tell you that for sure. It's been a while. Been a long time coming. Desperate, yep. dude. Desperate. And uh no, I mean the Knicks are close, but you know, obviously baseball season you gotta wait all the way to October. So the Rangers are right here. They're they're the, really the closest when you look at the time. If, if you think about of that call the other night, that was terrible, huh? That Jalen Brunson foul. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that was that's, that's crazy. You can't call that, especially part of the game where it was and where he was on the court like almost half court it's crazy but i just want to point out this i think the bold prediction here i think they're going to get to the finals i don't know if they're going to win but the rangers yeah 2012 right get to the conference final 2013 disappointing season mm -hmm. they, they got to the second round but disappointing exit 2014 new coach they got to the finals 2022 they get to the conference finals 2023 disappointing early exit 2024 new coach Stanley Cup Finals. Do you know what's the first time I've heard that? That I'm saying, like per that perfect timeline, like that's the first. That's actually the first time I've heard anyone say that. Like literally matches up. Yeah, it's years. crazy. Yeah. yeah, that's that is wild. I I uh I didn't put that together at all. Because um, yeah, because in 2013 they it was the Swords last year. They lost. Yeah. I mean, they got to the second round, but they got swept by. Or I think they won one game to the Bruins. Yeah, they, that Kreider had that OT goal and and. Yeah game four but no that's i mean that's funny how that works right like it's it's kind of and then you know obviously 10 years later jonathan quicks here after beating them in the cup final yeah. it's, it's crazy wild it about, might you know? happen. yeah it'd be funny too if they go out yeah. and get adam and Rick and they have those two on the team yep that they get it done i was just gonna say that yeah what justice that's great that, that yeah. timeline is pretty wild I, I honestly like uh you know never put that together you should you should tweet that put it out there Put it I guess there. I got to do it. Now, yeah. There, which... yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if. I mean, maybe I'm stupid, but I don't know if anyone's really kind of put that timeline together. I think I, it's it's gonna happen. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, yeah. It's really like itself. I, but this I time we have quick, not... so we'll win. Yeah, and Henry. Maybe, maybe we need to get side. Justin Williams at a retirement too. Yeah, that'd be good. Bring them all. Bring them all back. <laughs> what a just crazy. What what a difference 10 years can make in in any sport wild to see former players that were, were you guys 10 years ago elementary school Ten i years. was uh yeah sixth grade i sixth was grade? yeah i was probably fourth grade then because i think i'm two years no i'm 2014 i was you must eight, have been like probably yeah. eight yeah About eight so time flies that's crazy yeah. i felt like yesterday i was on my couch almost crying when martinez buried that that was my yeah. my senior prom i was uh on the Ooh. bus got a notification from es couldn't even watch the game couldn't even stream it back then got an espn notification uh la kings won the stanley cup and i was just like soaking in my in my seat on the bus uh it was, an, it was a night ruiner i actually uh i wanted to i didn't get a chance to talk to him but i did an interview with the golden knights like two weeks ago and it was an optional skate so the way it works in the media is 
uh, the availability when there's an optional skate, the only players that are available to talk to me are the ones that go on the ice. So Martinez didn't skate, so I couldn't talk to him, but I wanted to go up to him and like kind of have a conversation with him about, you know, that series and stuff. And it was a bummer that I couldn't talk to him, but, um, that would have been cool for sure. I mean, I've, I've talked to quick about it and stuff. Um, you know, which is interesting and, uh, yeah, man, it's just, everything kind of comes full circle in, in sports and stuff. It's kind of wild to see. Yeah, I know. I know we're kind of a little short on time here, but like, like, what what is Quick's just whole impression on playing with the Rangers? Kind of the vibe you've gone from him. Man, he's uh, he's tough to read. Like some nights he's in like yeah. a really good mood and gives you like a long, well thought out answer, and other nights he just, you know, doesn't really want to do it. Um, I think that's goalies though. Yeah, yeah. goalies are weird. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I I haven't talked to him as much lately just because, you know, I, you kind of gravitate toward the guys this time of year who you know you'll get something from um but i did like a one-on-one -on -one sit down with him earlier in the year and, and he was really nice and also like you know it depends like when you go to practice there there's a lot more time to talk to the guys and uh you know i i've been doing a new morning show so i haven't really been able to get to much practices lately um but after games like you know it's it's tough to kind of get a read on him but obviously you know he's very appreciative of being here I do imagine he wants that start on Sunday because I'm pretty sure he grew up a New York Giants fan, um, which would be really cool for him. So I, I don't know if Laviolette actually will go with him or not because of that. But I think, you know, most of hockey wants to see Shesterkin versus Sorokin. I think that's kind of what the storyline would be, would be best. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, Jonathan Quick has, you know, he wants to win. He's a winner. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think he's built himself a good enough legacy already in the NHL, but. Man, if you grow up a Ranger fan and you bring a cup back here and legend, like yeah. we're talking, we're talking potential statue. I'm not actually, but you know what I mean? Like a metaphor. Why not? Statue. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always, I'm always building the statue. Like that's always my thing. Yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be really special, obviously. And, you know, it's something that I think everyone dreams of. And yeah, I, I don't know if there's like even words for it for him, you know, right. It's just kind of, I've never seen one. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a big Giants fan. I'm not a big baseball fan. Like, you know, I root for the Giants, not a big Giants fan. I'm not really a baseball fan. I do root for the Mets, but I'm really Rangers Knicks, and I haven't seen either of them win. So I have no idea what it's like to see your team win. Um, so we'll see. Yep. Yeah, I definitely feel on that. I've, even though the Yankees won in 09, I was three. So I have no recollection <laughs> of that. So I feel your pain. I'm waiting for, waiting for a championship and, like we said, the Rangers are definitely the closest because just the timing and the football teams. I mean, I don't, I don't know really where that where they're going, but you know, yeah, guess guess we'll find out in the fall. So, anyway, to close things out here, really appreciate you coming on. Um, you mentioned your morning show and that, and in everything else, where can everybody find you and all the stuff you're doing? Uh, you can just find me on Twitter, jlazzy23. It's where I put all my stuff, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I've probably tweet too much. Uh, you know, need to need to try to learn how to shut it down every now and then. But uh, yeah, just just Twitter, you can find me there. And um, you know, I appreciate you guys for having me on. It's always fun talking to you guys. And and uh, I guess this is the new show, but uh, you know, happy to come on whenever. Yeah, definitely, totally uh, appreciate you coming on. Definitely check out all of his stuff. Um, we got a lot more content coming your way. And uh, as always, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for watching.